Okay, hi everybody. Glad you could join us tonight for an exclusive talk with Dr. Jenny Shea of UTSA on what the future holds for brain science. I'm Miriam Good, director of the Mind Science Foundation. And for those of you not familiar with us, we fund early career neuroscientists investigating the origins and the nature of human consciousness how the brain creates the mind, in other words, and projects that lead to improvements in the health and well being of humankind. And we do this through our annual Brainstorm Neuroscience Pitch Competition, uh, which you can find out about on our website, mindscience.org. And we also provide valuable educational programs, just like the one tonight, to give you trustworthy information and tools to help you discover the wonders of the human brain and to give you information with which to make the decisions to lead a richer, more meaningful life and one that we all want. So as we get started, if you want to, in the chat, if you wanna say hi, um, if you have a specific question, there is a Q&A section, if you could put it in there and we'll get to that at the end. And of course, there'll be a link to download the recording of this talk uh, early next week. So tonight I am thrilled to present renowned neuroscientist and Mind Science Foundation trustee, Dr. Jenny Shea. She is director of UTSA's Brain Health Consortium. And she's going to share with us how brain search, uh, research has evolved over the years. And she'll share insights into the technology used today, what advances are on the horizon in the coming decades, and what the practical effects are going to be for the general population with a special focus on the role of AI in studying new diseases like COVID-19. So welcome, Dr. Shea. Thank you. Also joining me tonight as co-host is Dr. Sean Guillory, former mind science intern and a cognitive neuroscientist at Booz Allen Hamilton. Welcome, Dr. Guillory. Will you kick off the conversation tonight? I can certainly do that. So yeah, uh, Jenny, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you having here. And then uh, I guess we get, uh, we'll just start from the top because neuroscience is a huge subject. Uh, if you could give us a little background in terms of um, what's kind of like the history of this great subject and like how we got here and how it used to be studied and uh, take away to uh, talking a little more on the present and then the exciting part in terms of what the future is, but uh, I'll take it away for you. Thank you very much. I will, I'd be delighted to talk to you, everyone tonight. So I will go ahead and share my slides. Okay. Okay, great. Can you see that okay? I certainly can. Uh, what's it look like, uh, folks in the chat? Can everyone see? Hopefully. It's good. All right, Great. so thank okay. you, Miriam, and thank you, Sean, for joining me and all of everybody, all of the audience who's out there. I'm delighted to have a conversation with everyone about the brain. It's my absolute favorite subject. And so, you know, just sit back, um, relax, and enjoy my talk. And I also invite you to ask me questions at any time during the presentation like a true conversation. If you were here in my living room with me, I would be happy to answer your questions or your comments, okay? So today I was thinking we could divide up the talk into three areas. I could go into a little bit about how, how are we studying the brain currently? And, and when I mean the past, I really mean in just the last few years because things are really moving very quickly. And then after that, I want to start to talk to you about really how ha has the current technology beginning to advance in terms of studying the brain? And then maybe end with thoughts about the future, how interdisciplinary science is probably going to be more and more something we're going to see and really important, particularly for neuroscience. Okay, so the first part is the past. 
So the most challenging thing about the brain, a really trying to understand how the brain works, and that's very important because the very first thing that you have to know is that over 95% of drugs do not translate to the clinic. So scientists like myself and my students, we're, we could be working as hard as we can doing research, but currently, or really even in, in the past, much of the research gets to a point where there's this large thing to overcome and we don't know why it's not translating. I mean, this is a big problem. This is a, definitely a challenge. And, and one of the things is that we're not really studying the human brain in the laboratory because you know, as we all know, it's it sits nicely protected in our in our heads. It's protected by the skull, and sometimes I joke and I said, you know, if I could only just have access to my own brain from childhood to now, I could have a better understanding. So the so so the most sort of the riddle is how what is it about our collective thoughts and minds? that we still can't figure out how our own brain works. And, and part of the reason is because in the lab, and I try to diagram here on the right, is we are studying what I call surrogates of the human brain. So, so we are studying, most of us are studying laboratory mice. Um, and the beauty of, of, of mice or rats is that they, are, uh, they have an accessible brain. You can use um, various technologies. You could, um, in a safe way, in a harmless way, you could, you could probe the rodent brain and you can really get very, very deep quickly into the, the, the intricate cell types of the brain about how the cells are firing in response to a, a particular stimulus. You can even manipulate the mouse's brain. So through, through that, through those types of studies, you know, scientists have gained a lot of insight. And you can then take that to the next level and even access non-human primate brains. So for example, even here in, uh, in San Antonio, there's um, a National Primate Research Center, Texas Biomed, and uh, there are scientists that we collaborate with and we can study, for example, the baboon brain or um, the marmoset brain, which is also evolving to be a very exciting um, model because it sits in between the rodent and the human. It's probably closer to the rodent side, to be perfectly honest. Um, there are larger non-human primate models, like for example, chimpanzee or gorilla, but because of ethical concerns, we are no longer allowed to do um, experiments with, um, with non-human primates such as ch chimpanzees and gorillas. So this is sort of coming back to um, how do we then try to study the human brain? So some scientists study the post-mortem brain, uh, you know, I sort of show here on the right, um, or you can make slices, or if you're so fortunate, you can work together with neurosurgeons who are doing epilepsy surgery and you can even get a little piece of this precious human brain tissue. Uh, however, those studies, they are, they're insightful, but they don't really allow you to get down into the, at the cellular and molecular level, especially to understand how the brain forms, because a lot of those tissue are um, already at the, um, you know, they're from maybe a part of the brain that already has a disease, or already has some type of pathology. So another way to study the human brain, kind of looking back, is you can grow uh, cell culture. So you can basically you know, make cells from stem cells, or you can even take tissue from the, uh, um, a precious piece of human tissue, but you could develop cell culture methods to propagate or to grow the cells. And, and you can even transform the cells with uh, oncogenes so that the cells live outside the human brain and they continue to divide and they even have electrical properties. So those are, those are all methods and tools that scientists have been using just to kind of get a glimpse at how the human brain work. But hopefully you can appreciate these are, these are cells that are in a dish or these are slices of the brain in a, in a well. So they're not the, the whole intact thing.
Okay. So we're kind of all studying little pieces of the puzzle. And so thinking ahead, you know, you, you have to figure out how are we going to take all of this information, these pieces of the puzzle, and how is it all going to come together? Because as, as someone who um, loves puzzles, I find them very, very challenging. And sometimes, you know, you could be working on a little corner of it and spend hours, days, weeks, and then realize when you take a step back that the thing that you're really missing is on the floor, <laughs> which often happens to me where that one piece of the puzzle isn't even on the table. Okay, and so that's the last uh, method that scientists use is uh, computational modeling. So you can take all of this information that biologists uh, and biochemists have, have synthesized or have, have produced. And if you're missing that piece of the puzzle, the computer program could substitute some information or some data and plug it in and try to form the whole, the whole picture. But we still don't really know is that is that the true picture? You know, is that just something that's a, like an artificial um, map or a network, but is that really anything like the real human brain? So just kind of put that thought in the, um, and, and I can also give you, uh, so I already sort of alluded to, epilepsy is a very important problem. And I wanna give you an example of how um, some research in my lab has started to tackle the problem of epilepsy. So it's very common. It affects one in 26 people in the US. So currently in America, there's at least 3 million active epilepsy patients and about 30% of them are resistant to medication. So they have seizures that just simply cannot be controlled with the currently available drugs. And they could also have drugs that uh, stop some of their seizures, but they'll come back or there's other side effects. So because of these reasons, we are very desperate and just trying to understand, uh, just trying to figure out what's, what contributes to epilepsy so that we can help these patients. Many of them are children. So one of the tools that currently, and also in the past, scientists have begun to use is something called DREDS. And uh, the, the name DREDS stands for a designer receptor exclusively activated by a designer drug. So I don't know if any of you are uh, like designer things. Um, personally, I find them very exclusive, hence the name, and, and very expensive. And, uh, and, and similarly, that is why these, uh, these uh, DREDS receptors get their name. And the reason why is because uh, so, so neuroscientists wanted to find a way of, okay, once we identify a brain cell and we hypothesize that that brain cell is causing epilepsy, but we don't really know because it is surrounded by, you know, a hundred million other cells. And so if we want to, so for a neurosurgeon who is really trying to help a patient with epilepsy, they have to map out very, very precisely where are the seizures starting, where are the seizures propagating, how to essentially, you know, if they're going to remove some of the of the human brain that's causing the seizures, at the same time, how do they spare as much of the circuits so that it doesn't cause any side effects. And so if you could understand down to a single cell level or even a circuit, that is the best way of targeting, of finding a good target for treating epilepsy. So one of the tools that scientists have used is to basically use these designer receptors. And the reason why they are designer is because if you introduce these receptors into the brain cell, there are no other drugs or chemicals in the body that can activate them. So that's good. It means it can just kind of quietly you know, be in the brain cell and, uh, and not cause any harm or damage. But when you introduce this now designer ligand, that's when you can activate the designer drug. So it's just a way of turning on the light switch exactly when you want it and in what cell type, and then you can also turn it off, okay? So using that tool, um, we decided to study this very special population of brain cells or neurons. So I, 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 wanted, I use this slide because it 
reminds me to remind you, uh, reminds me to tell you that my lab studies these cells that are deep within this particular structure. This structure is called the hippocampus. It's really called the dentate gyrus. It's a part of the hippocampus where a lot of the excitatory information from the cortex filters in. And then it, this is like the first layer of the hippocampus. And hopefully you can see that there's these really beautiful neurons. They're really neural stem cells that reside in this one single layer. And the reason why I was so excited by these neural stem cells, oh, I would say 20, at least 20, 25 years ago when I first started my postdoc studies is because first of all, I learned that the brain doesn't contain any more stem cells after the after development, right? So I learned you can you can kind of go through the textbook and you know that you you make your stem cells make these neurons, and at a certain point, all of the neurons are post mitotic, meaning they stop dividing, and there's no more regeneration. Okay, so unlike the blood or hair or skin, which constantly regenerates from a stem cell population, neurons don't do that. So that's why I was so excited when I learned that that's in fact not true because in this particular region of the brain, there are still neural stem cells, they still divide. And what's really interesting about them is that they're hyper excitable. That means that when they're still immature, they are more active than their mature, uh, the cells next to them, okay, which are the ones in blue, okay? That's an artificial color. And they remind me of toddlers and teenagers, okay? So, so just like my own kids, so these are my daughters and then these are my nephews. And whenever they get together, they are hyper excitable all of the time. So these neural stem cells similarly are, they're, we call them newborn neurons. They're extremely active. And so we wanted to know in epilepsy, could the activity of these newborn neurons, because they're so excitable, could that be something that contributes to, to seizure formation or these um, epileptic circuits? So Zane Librand, who was at the time, he was a research assistant professor, and now he has his own lab at Texas Women's University in Dallas. He tested this with this designer receptor, this so-called DREAD. And because it's a rodent model, he could inject DREADs very precisely into the hippocampus. He can target these, these newborn neurons, those, those hyper excitable neural stem cells, and, and, uh, and then he can induce epilepsy in, a, in the mouse. And then he can give it this designer drug to activate those, those uh, newborn neurons. In this case, he actually turns the switch off. So he's silencing the newborn neurons. So in that, and, and then what he wanted to do is if he silenced, like turn the switch off in these newborn neurons compared to the control, what would happen to the seizures that develop in these mice? Okay, that was the question. And these green cells are, uh, is a, it's a fluorescent molecule. It comes from jellyfish actually. And we use, we actually use this beautiful fluorescent reporter because it allows us when we make cross sections of the mouse brain tissue, we can visualize these newborn neurons very easily. And we can also look at their beautiful shape and morphology, which is really, it helps us kind of start to correlate their morphology and whether it's kind of normal looking or abnormal looking, and then compare that to the seizures that develop in these mice. So what, what Zane did is he can, just like you would put um, like electrodes, if, if a patient that has epilepsy and they're going to have epilepsy surgery, they would do a craniotomy and then they would put these electrodes or grids that sort of touch the surface of the brain or even their, they go into the brain, they're called depth electrodes. We can do something very similar to a mouse. So we can basically implant a, tr a transmitter. It's a wireless transmitter and it detects these, uh, these EEG signals. 
Okay. And so what Zane found is that in the placebo treated mice, those mice, they're developing about three to four seizures a day. And interestingly, that the, the designer drug treated mice, the one that we turned off the these newborn neurons, these mice, they still have seizures, but there, there's much fewer seizures. There's only about one or two seizures a day. So it's, it's like a 60% reduction in the number of seizures in these mice. So that really kind of got us jumping for joy. And we thought we were onto something. And it also supported some of our other work where we, in the past, when we uh, basically uh, ablated or killed these neurons. So now we found that we don't have to kill them because if you, you know, we, we sort of rationalize that for a patient that's getting epilepsy surgery or even a patient who's getting treated, you, we, we don't want to just like right now, the gold standard is to remove the cells or to remove the tissue. But what if we could just understand their aberrant activity and try to block that and then see if how the, if there's no side effects, that's great. And then for a certain, and maybe we can even have it reversible because those cells may become normal over time and they could still be part of the circuit. So we were thinking initially that if we could find a way of sort of turning on and off the switch with these designer receptors, that could be more efficacious and just, just sort of less side effects over time. And without removing the cells down the road, we can also understand what are the properties of the cells and what are the circuits that these cells are in that contribute to their function, okay? So that is a good stopping point for me to sort of take us, bring us all to, to, to this summary. So in the human brain, there's about a hundred million neurons, okay? So how do, how do our, some of our studies in the past in these rodents, how does it translate? To, to the human situation, okay? So it turns out that in a, in a rodent animal, there's about 3,000 newborn neurons a day. And so that has been extra, extrapolated based on the size of the rodent brain to the human brain. So it's been estimated that maybe the, the human brain develops 9,000 newborn neurons per day. And that sounds like a big number. And if you think about it, you're, you might be wondering, well, how can I get more newborn neurons? Because that's the first thing I was wondering. And it turns out if you exercise and you have a healthy diet and you have um, low, you know, try to keep a low stress in your life, there's a lot of things that can increase your neurogenesis. And that was something my postdoctoral mentor, Rusty Gage, and his colleagues showed, you know, quite a while ago. So that really excited me and motivated me to go to the gym. Okay, with that aside, still out of these 100 million neurons, even if there's 9,000 or 10,000 newborn neurons per day, that's still a tiny fraction of the cells that out of the whole brain. And with conventional methods like fMRI or PET scanning, you cannot see these newborn neurons. So that's why that's a challenge and an opportunity. So I think, we really need to understand more about what's unique about these newborn neurons, if they give off a unique signature or if they, have ex if they express new or different genes or some marker, that is still a, an area of active research. So even if you were to have the tool or technology to be able to you know, prospectively find these newborn neurons in the human brain, how would you manipulate the human brain without causing damage or off-target effects? So that's why you know, we started to move closer and closer to using these designer receptors because we thought that that could kind of get us more to precise manipulation of certain cell types and hopefully reduce the side effects. But I think another question that we're still thinking about is what are the differences? So we, again, we're studying a mouse um, and is that similar or different to a human brain, okay? So that kind of gets me to the present. So many of us in the field have been wondering about the human brain. 
you know, we've been working on the rodent brain, we've been working on cell cultures for a long time. And so we were really emboldened and inspired by President Obama's initiative in 2013, when he basically launched this NIH brain initiative. So the National Institutes of Health, it's our largest funding, federal funding for biomedical research. They decided to uh, appropriate additional, a large amount of money in order to form this initiative. And it stands for Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies or BRAIN. And it's organized so that it's going to fund projects in these seven different areas, as you can see here on this slide. And the idea is that there's additional funding for the next 10 years. So this started in 2015, it's gonna go through 2025. And so currently to date, actually through 2019, there has been two, 700 awards uh, already given out. Those awards are a uh, total $1.3 billion, $1 billion. According to the Brain 2025 report, uh, there's about 500 million per year that's on top of the funding that is appropriated for neuroscience research. So it's about a 4.5 billion total for a 12 year budget, which is very significant. There are those seven priority funding areas and it involves 10 NIH institutes and centers, and there's also partners. So NIH is partnering with NSF, with DARPA, the FDA, and IARPA. And so, so far, according to their website, over 1,200 papers have been produced from these over 700 awards. And so if you do the math, it comes down to about 1.75 papers per award, which is about $1 million per paper. Okay, so I hope, hopefully you can appreciate that science is ex expensive. Okay, the, the data, all of the data, in order to generate it in a rigorous and reproducible manner, it takes a lot of teams of scientists, students and postdocs and other trainees working together. And the reagents are very expensive. The tools are very expensive. It's and this is all extremely necessary to have the best science that gets published. And the beauty of it is all of it is publicly available. So let me give you a couple of vignettes of what the BRAIN Initiative has, has started to do in the past seven or so years. So one of them, which I was really excited about, was to hear about this Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. And just like the United States Census that we're all very familiar, familiar about because we got those, uh, it, we either got it in the mail or we got it online and we definitely had to add up the people in our household and contribute that information. If, uh, I don't know if everyone uh, can appreciate, but we don't really have an accurate and clear census of the cells of the human brain. So that's the first step, okay? So the, the, the cell information for the nervous system, it was probably first um, created or deduced in lower animals or lower uh, vertebrates or even invertebrate model systems. When I was a graduate student, I studied a microscopic nematode called C. rhabditis elegans. And C. elegans has a, every single cell type of the C. elegans is counted for. I always use this example. There's approximately 998 somatic cells. And then those are the non-germ cells. And that includes the nervous system. And then the rest of the worm are, are the germ cells. And so, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very simple model system. And if one cell is ablated by a laser, sometimes another cell will replace it from a stem cell. So that's like a perfectly simple model to, to do cell, you know, to do a first cell census count. But now when you, to go from there, something about a thousand cells to now a hundred million cells, Think about the order of magnitude complexity. So how, how are we going to solve this problem? So, so the one thing is we that this is what the brain initiative has, you know, 
allowed scientists to do in these very large scale research projects. So here on this slide is just some of the beautiful images of various neuroscience types of approaches and tools in, in order to try to grasp the cell type and the way the cells connect to other cells, okay? So some of them involve using fluorescent-based tracers, uh, and I'll give you an example of that. Other one is using um, methods that take the parts of the brain and it remove the whole, like think about taking the puzzles apart and basically taking account, you know, getting an accurate information of each of the piece or each of the cells at a very detailed molecular level. And that's what some of these images are showing. And then you can try to piece it all back. Okay, so another example and two more examples, quick examples of what the Brain Initiative has, has um, some recent studies. One I thought was really interesting. So I don't know some of you, if you have the same experience, but sometimes you're, you can't sleep and you wake up and you feel hungry. And I, I always thought, well, it's my empty stomach telling me to go to the refrigerator and I wanna grab a, you know, a brownie or a cookie or something, ice cream. And, it, it turn, and I always thought, you know, my, my stomach seems to have a mind of its own, but it turns out that Shen and Bohor Quez, Quez at Duke University, they discovered that there is a direct circuit from the gut to the brain. And that was research that was novel and funded by the Brain Initiative in order to identify this new gut brain neural circuit. So I, so now it turns, and, and the circuit works extremely fast. So it kind of made the field appreciate that the, the brain may not just be in the brain or in your head, that there's obviously there's other circuits that are important and control your behavior. Another example, and this kind of goes back to epilepsy patients. So one, one of the most ch um, biggest challenges of, of um, you know, sort of neuroscience and brain disorder is when pa patients are paralyzed or they have a loss of speech from, uh, from, tra from you know, traumatic brain injury or other types of injury. And so the way of re you know, recovering their speech, the current technology um, works for uh, maybe one sentence and it's slow. Okay, so there are tools available, but it's not ideal. So these scientists, uh, Dr. Chang at UCSF and his team, they were funded from the Brain Initiative. They found a way of that you can, what they did is they studied epilepsy patients during surgery, and they were able to, re when an epilepsy patient before surgery, there's like two weeks with, where they put the electrodes to, uh, map the signals of this of the brain so that they can really refine their um, where they're going to you know resect the tissue but during that two week period you can also use these signals to help you do uh, types of research and so th this research were um, in order to reproduce the speech synthesis, what the scientists did was they basically looked at these signals and they asked the patients to speak. And so, and they found, they, they developed a computer program, an algorithm, which basically could synthesize or could basically make the speech sound from the brain waves or from the oscillations. And what they found when they superimposed like the computer synthesized speech with the actual person's speech and they put them like right on top of each other, they found they were just amazingly, you know, synchrony. And uh, so it was very exciting, but of course some of this raised some ethical questions about privacy issues and things of that nature. Um, if we are if we are able to really have technology that could produce speech from your thoughts, what would that mean? So that's something we can talk about. <laughs> okay, so th those are some of those brain initiative funded um, grants. So I wanna kind of bring it back to some of the, again, the research uh, <clears throat> we're doing here at UTSA. 
So I mentioned there's these um, nice ways of trying to understand the cell connections or connectome. And my uh, and Zane, when he was in my lab, he kind of went back into this epilepsy model to try to take advantage of some of these uh, brain initiative tools. And one of them is this virus tracing system. So we're all familiar with a virus as, a, as something that infects us and gets us sick. But it turns out that scientists have been using viruses for decades. Um, we call them viral vectors. So we basically make the viruses, we engineer them so that they're not infectious, but then we can put genes into the viruses and, and use their, the, their properties of being able to bind to certain cell types to introduce the genes we want to introduce. So in this case, Zane injected this pseudotyped rabies virus. It's not the real rabies virus receptor. And he put them again into a mouse, into those hyperexcitable, you know, those newborn neurons that fire like teenagers. And then he induced epilepsy. He gave it again, the designer drug. And then he waited. And now he infected the mouse with this rabies virus. It's, it's a pseudotype laboratory version of the rabies virus. And the, and the way, the reason why he did that is because the rabies virus has a way of infecting a cell and then, and then going from that infected cell to the cell it's connected to. So that it kind of takes advantage of the properties of that virus. And so here's a cartoon representation of how that looks. So if we inject the rabies virus receptor, which is in red, together with the dread, which is in green, okay? So it's like a Christmas tree. So the cells are infected, but if they could go together, red and green is yellow. So you can see in this picture, all of the yellow cells, these newborn cells that are, that are yellow, that means that both receptors got in. And then later after the epilepsy and after the designer drug, he could see which cells did the rabies, with, which cells are connected to these newborn cells, which we didn't know at the time. Okay, because there's, again, millions of cells, even in a mouse's brain. So in order to identify the cells that are, that are touching, that are connecting to the newborn cells, we had to, this rabies virus could, because it moves from one cell to another that it's connected to, it lets us see this. And so this is what we found, and I'm summarizing here. So in the placebo group, it, we basically got these cell types that is connected to our newborn cells. And most of them were not really surprising. They were cells from the cortex that are, uh, that are connected to, but mostly it's cells, it's neighbors. It's connected to its neighbors, okay? And then it's also connected to these other cells which normally kind of inhibit the newborn cells. During epilepsy, something changes. So the neighboring cells it's connected to goes down those, those interneurons or those cells that normally inhibit the newborn cells, those don't change. But now we see increases of these other regions, these other cells elsewhere. So we think that this is evidence of, of circuits that are not normal, that only happen during epilepsy and maybe even contribute to these seizures, right? It's like, the, it's amplifying the newborn cells. So they're already excitable and they're now even more excitable, right? Not like no grown up is coming in there to you know, calm them down. They're, they're all in the same room and they're bouncing off the walls. But now when we treat them with the designer dread, what happens? So what happens is that those, those uh, excitatory signals, uh, circuits, those seems to go down and then it we see a restoration of the normal circuit, okay? So that's an example where we can use these tracers to kind of start looking at the circuits. So the challenge here is how do we organize this complex circuit uh, data, tools and knowledge, and how do we do it across those different modalities? So that's where the brain initiative is really crucial because 
part of it is making sure that the data is publicly available, it's rapidly disseminated, it's all acquired using the same tools or using even the same um, methods and standards. Because before then, different labs would acquire data in a different uh, modality or maybe using different quality control standards. So because of this initiative, it helped organize and make sure the data is quality control and it can be shared with the community as quickly and immediately as possible. Okay, so finally, in the last five minutes, I wanna talk about the future. So hopefully I already kind of give everyone a glimpse that the brain is so complex and it's still very difficult to study the human brain, but we're starting to kind of move towards that direction. But now we really need teams of people that can work together. People who are coming at it from different disciplines like biology, chemistry, physics, mathematicians, computer science, and even more because sometimes someone, you don't have to be a classically trained neuroscientist to have a curiosity of something. And sometimes you think about the brain in a way that none of us ever have because we're too, you know, we're sort of too, we've, we've been obsessing about something too much and maybe we need to think outside the box. Okay, so one, one tool people have been using to kind of accelerate the information is the power of AI. And I wanna just kind of talk about that for COVID. So one thing is, you know, we know this, this was something that affected the world and we really need to get drugs and of course develop the vaccine as soon as possible, but we didn't wanna do this in a competitive way and have people being working in silos. So what AI have, has been doing is really shortening this process, right? So you can use, you can sort of mine all of the data sets that's there at different places and using these sophisticated neural networks, find based, just look at the existing data, data and see if there's any insights that can be gleaned. And so for example, the company Benevolent AI in London has been doing that. You can also, you know, as soon as information about the structure of the coronavirus was made available, instead of trying to, you know, for somebody to try to solve the, the structure again, which could take years and years and years, companies or AI technology like AlphaFold or even in Silico and others, they try to accelerate understanding of the viral structure based on using different computer algorithms. And then more importantly, we're hearing so much about these variants, right? So the viruses are mutating, they're, they, you know, they're making changes in their nucleic acid sequences. We don't know if that's gonna increase virulence or this is a way that the virus can evade the immune system or even become resistant to antiviral treatments. But the AI can help us predict these viral mutations so that we can basically go, we can use these machine learning um, computational technologies to predict what maybe are the next generation mutations and then look at it just in silico, uh, the structure of COVID-19, predict, you know, guess what are these, some of these key possible functional sites, look at the existing data sets of drugs and see if we can even repurpose the current existing drugs and that can rapidly accelerate through the life cycle, pharmaceutical life cycle. Okay, so in the last minute, I wanna talk about just very quickly COVID and the brain. So we know that the symptoms of COVID-19, I don't really need to go into this. We also know that lung is the you know, accepted major target site, but maybe what we didn't all appreciate at the time is that there could be also damage to the brain. So one of the things we're hearing is, and, and we know this from our own, some of our own experiences of our loved ones or friends, there could be um, neurological symptoms and in some cases even quite severe. And so the question, the million dollar question, at least in my mind is does SARS-CoV-2, the, vir the, the virus causing agent, does it directly penetrate the human brain? So the human brain has a very elaborate barrier, a blood brain barrier. So is, is all of the symptoms indirect 
a, an indirect consequence of inflammation or does the virus, can it infect brain cells? So what we thought we could do to take a look at this, and this was my PhD student, Courtney McMahon in the lab, she cleverly used a stem cell model where she could take human pluripotent stem cells, which is something we created here at UTSA. And we can uh, grow these cells in a dish to form these organoids that resemble the human brain. I mean, they're, they're immature and they're like a developing brain. And so Courtney worked with scientists at Texas Biomed. She infected the organoids with the SARS-CoV-2. And long story short, she found that even with very low doses of the virus and very short infection time, that there can be infection of some of the brain cells that's here highlighted by these arrows. So the arrows point to, and we were surprised by this. It was a very particular type of brain cell called the glial cell. And I'm happy to talk to people in the chat later about why I think the glial cells are, um, are fascinating. So really, in the end, I really want to kind of end with it's the importance of interdisciplinary collaboration and how what we are very interested in doing is educating and training our students um, about how to use some of these cutting edge tools and, and making sure they have the right environment to work together. So here at UTSA, we assemble this collaborative team called the Brain Health Consortium, and it really goes across um, sciences and engineering, psychology, behavior, and, and, and uh, neuroscience. And we also are fortunate to have this beautiful new building that we could work and collaborate in. And our mission is to really work together, just sort of inspired by the Brain Initiative and, and, and to kind of put our disciplines together, our, our techniques together, and hopefully we have, we can apply, uh, understand the brain a little better and apply those, that knowledge to preventing and treating brain disorders. And, and we really want to kind of answer these questions, use these technologies, and train our students. And so today I hopefully you know, gave you a little sample of what, how we studied the brain, the past, the present, and the future. And going forward, I'm really excited by all of these new opportunities for research and education for student training. I really want to thank the students that work with me. I know some of them were on the call today. And um, I'm also just want everyone to know that we are excited and also um, interested in any opportunities for partnering with Mind Science for outreach. And that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Jenny. This was amazing and really um, encouraging. Uh, I know that we're all at the end of a year, you know, and still have time to go with the current pandemic, but to hear about the collaborations, how AI has been used to fast track our understanding of the disease is very encouraging. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I'd love to hear about the work that you're doing and the students, you know, we have a heart for young researchers and I know that you are mentoring many young students yourself, many future neuroscientists. Uh, so I'm, I would like to have uh, Sean go ahead and kick off Q&A. We have some really interesting uh, questions coming up. And then you also mentioned uh, maybe talking a little bit about glial cells. So, uh, Sean, you want to take it away? Sure. There certainly have been some interesting questions. And even with the first one that I'm going to ask, uh, uh, I've been doing a little sleuthing in the background. I even found like the, the exact article that they're talking about and then even the um, uh, journal article that comes from as well. So I'm just going to put those in the chat for folks to check out. But this one, first one comes from Sherry Steeles. Uh, I recently read an article that, quote, Researchers find and fix a serious flaw in blood-brain barrier research, raising hopes of creating a more accurate model of the human blood-brain barrier for studying certain neurological diseases and developing drugs that can cross it. Is this accurate? And where are we with crossing the blood-brain barrier? Yes, so that's a great question. So I can answer that in the context of the organoids first. So one, so yes, that's true. So there have been recent studies coming out of MIT 
that have um, that have developed methods to create a blood brain barrier in this uh, organoid system. And that's really important because until then, the organoids lack blood vessels and so then they certainly lack the the barrier, which is a unique type of, you know, the way the blood vessels kind of adhere to each other and together with these glial cells. And, and the barrier is really important for a number of reasons. They protect us from infection. They also protect us from drugs and other foreign pathogens. And so in order to study the relationship of the blood-brain barrier to COVID-19, it wasn't, in, you know, now that we have this blood-brain barrier model, that can really accelerate things and make it much more uh, translational. So I don't know if I answered the, that particular question, but. I think it gets us close in terms of like uh, uh, where we are like currently at. And uh, um, yeah, like I said, with that, we can take away the next one. Uh, the next one, I got a little more um, specification in chat. So this one comes from uh, VP uh, Swami Nathan, uh, doctor. Uh, how you doing, doc? Uh, in terms of how big are neurons and can we see them under optical electro uh, electron microscope? I tried to ask if it was like soma um, or just general length. Um, I think they're just interested in the size in general and if there is growth. Uh, so uh, a little more broad than that. I don't know if that came about when you were showing like some of the like uh, CA1 um, and some of the things in terms of hippocampus, if you want to kind of constrain it to that, uh, feel free. I, want, I wonder if the question is when I mentioned, um, yes, I'm sorry. So I, I do apologize. There is about 100 billion human, uh, 100 billion neurons neurons, not million. So I, that, that's a mistake. That's a typo, I think, on my slide. So I'm sorry about that. So that's even a, a larger magnitude to the, those newborn neurons I was talking about. And I, so I wonder if the question is because there's so few of these newborn neurons. And so I, I'm not sure the issue is the size of the neuron per se, but just that there's just such a small number. And I think it is below the level of detection by our, by our current imaging methods and, and things of that nature. And so I think it is a challenge. I think there's, there was a study at um, MD Anderson or Baylor, I wanna, I wanna say 15 years ago that was using NMR spectroscopy that was trying to tackle this issue. But um, I haven't seen anything recently. And I know there's a new funding opportunity in order to develop new tools to identify specifically these newborn neurons. So I would say stay tuned. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, like I said, uh, I think you knocked that one out of the park. Um, next one comes from uh, Dr. Samuel Garcia. What role does brain-derived neurotropic factor uh, or BDNF uh, play in neurogenesis and what activities or elements stimulate the release of this protein to help promote neurogenesis? Ooh, okay, so it's very specific, but um, yeah, if you could just talk about a little bit more in terms of uh, BNF and uh, the kind of things that we do see it, it's gonna usually gonna be around like uh, memory, uh, mm -hmm sometimes age-related memory and things uh, I even know in terms of like post-chemo, there's yeah. some things in terms of looking around that. But if you want to talk a little bit just in general uh, about BDNF, yeah. feel free. So it's, it's really clear. So from the, the rodent studies I have seen, BDNF does play a very important role. So for neurogenesis, it promotes the survival of those newborn neurons. So I don't know why the brain does this, but it's something that has always puzzled me. So I mentioned that there are these 9,000 newborn neurons. So if you were to take um, 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 this, if you were to actually put a pulse of bromodeoxyuridine, it's actually a DNA thymidine analog, which incorporates into replicating cells and patients with cancer, it's a way we try to image their tumor cells. If you put that same molecule into the hippocampus, you can really light up these newborn neurons. There's lots of dividing cells, but it does not correlate with the number of new neurons that are generated or survive. So why does the brain make 
a lot more neural stem cells and newborn neurons than it needs. And, and there's also this question of, are they competing for like, does the best neuron win that integrate and every, every other neuron, newborn neuron dies? And so I think to answer the question, the BDNF, BDNF has been shown that promotes the survival of these newborn neurons. And there's many, many studies like in Alzheimer's models and other models that BDNF improves cognition and it's correlated with more neurogenesis. Mm -hmm. And we are also using BDNF in our organoid cultures to promote differentiation and maturation of the organoid neurons. I think we have time for one more question and I'm going to go ahead and skip down to uh, Robert Eldy. Uh, what is known about neurotropism of other members of the coronavirus family? So I think there are lots of great questions about in general, what is their neurotropism of, you know, either the SARS-CoV-1 or the SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses. And I think that from the, the, you know, some of the recent data, it's really still controversial. In fact, I was on a grant panel that was discussing this very question. There seems to be some evidence that there is detection of the virus in the brain of human patients, but there's just as much evidence that does not see the virus in infected neurons of the patients. So I, I just went to the lab the other day and I talked to my students and we are just trying to make sense of these data. We're not sure if part of it is complicated by other underlying disease that the patients have. Um, and so that's something that's complicating, I think kind of muddying the waters a little bit. So in the laboratory setting with various models, you could test much more specifically about these questions like, does the virus have tropism for neurons or glial cells or neither? <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think that's still something we're very interested in. And also what are the functional, you know, what does it have to do to the function of the, of the brain cells after virus infection? So, you know, we're hearing a lot about these, the long COVID-19 and so we're excited now that we also have this opportunity to kind of model this in the laboratory setting. Wow, I, I feel like we could go on for another hour or two, um, <laughs> but we, we're gonna wrap it up tonight. And I wanna say thank you, Dr. Shea. Thank you, Dr. Guillory. Um, if we were not able to get to your question tonight, I apologize, um, lots of great questions. Thank you all so much for joining us. We have more programming coming up, so keep an eye on your inbox. And once again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Shea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for the great questions, too. Take care, everybody.